Hello, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of AWS reInvent 2021. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. We're on site, we're hybrid. It's a hybrid event. We've got Udil Jardim, Vice President of North America Solution Engineering at Salesforce. Udil Sim, thank you for coming on theCUBE. Thank you, John, excited to be here. So, you know, Salesforce obviously, um, being in Palo Alto in the Bay Area, they got the Salesforce Tower, great business, cloud before cloud, great innovation, a lot of growth, and it's been very successful with SaaS and platform. So you take that to the government um, and area, public sector, where public sector and other areas around this have been exploding with the pandemic with new use cases mm -hmm. and just kind of a refactoring and replatforming of all aspects of digital. It's been a big digital transformation surge, and rightfully so. You guys are in the mix here. Um, talk about the Salesforce's position as you guys innovate and scale your platform and rethink this architecture with AWS and the public sector. Yeah, thank you, John. So you spot on, Salesforce defines SaaS as a uh, delivery of services to customers. And that's really the precursor to where we are with cloud here. So let's talk about public sector and what that means. I'm very proud to work in and around public sector for many years and our Salesforce public sector group supports any number of use cases, different missions, anywhere from state and local all the way through to federal use cases on, on a global scale. But what that means, and coming right back to your question, is how do we deliver this in the cloud in a scalable, responsive way? You mentioned the pandemic, and throughout the pandemic, we were instrumental in, in trying to deliver these services and getting states and localities, towns, countries, up and running to deliver the critical things that we all learned about in a hurry, contact tracing, COVID testing, all these ideas around vaccine management, what it takes to get vaccines to populations. But many of our customers, many of our governments just weren't well positioned to do that. So what they were relying on was a secure, scalable, flexible environment that allowed them to define their workflows or their business models in a very, very rapid pace as we were dealing with the surge and the constantly changing landscape of the pandemic. So from our perspective, we've spent years investing in public sector to make sure that we meet the compliance requirements, whether that's FedRAMP or DFARS or CMMC or Protected B in Canada, how do we do that reliably quickly so that our government customers can rely on us for situations like the pandemic to be able to respond really quickly. Yeah, and one of the things we've been doing a lot of reporting around is the idea that the pandemic has kind of forced, and it was a forcing function around digital transformation. Yep. Uh, so I have to ask you, knowing the history of Salesforce and the greatness of the company that you guys have had over the years, uh, when you get into the public sector, I'm sure you get all kinds of questions. We don't have sales forces, we, <laughs> and we don't have sales managers. That's right. um, we don't need a CRM. Um, and we have industry regulations, so we're not a commercial thing. How do you answer those? Because you guys have infrastructure, you are a hyperscale. Uh, what's your take on that? And how do you answer those direct questions when they come up? All great questions and yes, we get them all the time. Uh, so how do we answer them? Well, first and foremost, the idea of a CRM is around putting your customer at the center of your view of them. So that customer relationship management means you, you have a view into the services your customer needs and how they're engaging with you. Digital engagement, in-person engagement, et cetera. I would contend that that's no different for a government entity than it is for a consumer-based entity. A government entity wants to treat their constituents around the services they need and getting that full 360 view of what, what are the services available to them? How do they access them, et cetera, actually fits really well into that CRM model, but it does take some explaining and re-envisioning it, but it plays really well into the digital transformation imperatives that these agencies have. Because what you want to do in a digital transformation is also reimagine all these old systems and legacy systems, how you're going to make them more accessible, but also to your point, how do you bring them to this level of expectation that our consumers have? I'm now accustomed to having mobile apps and on-demand uh, applications and websites for ordering products, for ordering needs, et cetera, for booking a, a restaurant reservation. I've developed the exact same requirements and expectations of my government services. And our government customers are keenly aware of this. So they want to bring this capability to the fore and offer their constituents a better experience as well. When you asked about government regulations, this is absolutely critical to how we think about delivering that service. The value of the cloud isn't just, you can go get access to a service and not have to worry about that service. It's also how do we unencumber agencies 
from these compliance requirements, from audits, from privacy checks and needs in a constantly evolving landscape. Right? There's always a legislative imperative to change something, add more uh, constraints, more privacy requirements, more compliance requirements, et cetera. So what we want to do is free our customers up from having to worry about that. That's what we undertake. We provide them that level of assurance and they focus once again on that higher value of the business flows, the mission, the constituency context and how to make that constituent experience better. But I have to ask you, I had a chance to sit down one-on-one -on -one with Adam Slepsky, the new CEO of AWS recently, uh, prior yes. to reInvent. And he said something to me I want to get your reaction to. He said, with scale, you can get visibility on some new use cases. So this applies to Salesforce. You guys are a hyperscaler. You have this new architecture named Hyperforce. What is this all yes. about and how does that tie into Celebsky's comment? Yeah, uh, excellent question. And we'll talk a little about that history that brings us to, to Hyperforce. So just like many of our customers, we realize that having the ability to scale across the globe and be able to offer our services in different regions, different compliance requirements meant that our investments in first party data centers needed to be reconstructed a little bit. And that imposed a bit of a re-architecture for us as well, but that's what gave us the flexibility then to essentially decouple our architecture from the, the physical infrastructure layer, but it afforded us then the ability to deploy very quickly and very scalably on AWS in regions that we previously weren't operating in. So it allows us to move a lot quicker, allows us to bring that flexibility and that scale to the customer where they are. And then we can meet, once again, coming back to compliance and regulations, we can meet requirements around data residency and data privacy requirements in different regions that we were somewhat constrained in doing earlier. And that also then gives us the ability, I think to what Adam might've been alluding to, now that we're able to bring that service to the customer, they can say, well, actually here's another use case that I would like Salesforce to deliver on. And it gives us that flexibility. We do a lot in terms of expanding across use cases. And if I can point to the pandemic again, just as a great frame of reference that we're all thrust into. Initially, if you cast your mind back to May of last year, we were all worried about contact tracing. Right? No side of vaccines yet. We didn't even have COVID testing available. Well, shortly thereafter, COVID testing became available and municipalities, states were offering those. Well, that from contact tracing to COVID testing is a massive shift if you think about the use case for technology. So we enable our customers to move very quickly from contact tracing to COVID testing then to vaccine management. They're actually entirely different use cases, even though they all apply to solving for the pandemic. But we had so many others, digital outreach, helping with loans and grants and management through the PPP programs, through unemployment programs, all different use cases that we helped our customers extend to. But you can't do that if you're not flexible enough to move quickly and scale effectively to, to support those. I think that value proposition, that notion of having that regional global support is going to really yep. come into the whole data programmability trend. I call it data as DevOps kind of vibe where data as code becomes more, more agile, right? And you're going to see that. I think that's going to be that's a big theme at a reInvent this year. So, so I have to ask you now, you, now we're sitting in this global scale, you got geopolitics, you got public sector. How does Salesforce Government Cloud Plus and Hyperforce help your help governments and their partners because their ecosystems too, right? So it's yes. kind of commercial now. It's a, it's looking a lot like a commercial the lines between commercial and government looking the same. How do you guys help mm -hmm. governments and their partners? So having been in this this uh, area for so long, I I like to position this, and I I use this actually as a a good selling point, even in selling the value propositions for investment internally. I think of the government regulations and requirements around privacy compliance as a minimum barrier of entry. So our, uh, you mentioned our government cloud plus, that's really more in the US and it's uh, FedRAMP uh, attested at, at a FedRAMP high level. We've got privacy overlays, we've got our DOD R4 uh, PA in there. We've got HIPAA and PCI compliance baked in. Those are efforts that if a company or a, a government customer were to go run through individually, it's going to take them a lot of time, uh, effort and investment to support those. And you end up creating an operations business that just does that 24 seven. That's the only reason for them to exist 
is to manage those. But then we have the government adjacent industries that you're referring to. What about the partners that service government? They have their own set of, of regulations, DFARs, more recently CMMC coming out, et cetera. We provide all of those as a baseline for our government cloud plus. So that level of assurance is assumed by customers and consumers of the service. And again, they're worried about what type of data and what type of business workflows they're going to enable and not can they meet the basic regulations to stand up the service. Yeah, I think that highlighting the workflows piece is critical because workflows yeah. is, is the new integration layer, right? So you're seeing a lot of that. And again, that's a big theme out of reInvent this year. Obviously the performance yeah. stuff is, is key, Graviton too, all the processor stuff and, and you know, it's Lambda and all the serverless. But as you move up to the stack where there's actual agility and modern applications that need to be built, whatever they are, you yep. need to have this programmable cloud scale, but the customization on workflows and machine learning and AI. So this is all beautiful for everyone to think about, but now they have to implement it. So how might your customers and prospects consider expanding their offerings with Salesforce in the cloud? Is there, is there a certain playbook that you see? Is there a situational awareness that's needed? How would you advise your customers who want to consider expanding uh, their portfolio and their, their apps and workflows with Salesforce? Yeah, that's a, a fantastic question too, John. And, and uh, I'm going to start with, uh, again, going back a little bit to what is Salesforce and who are we as a company? So in as much as we started talking about Salesforce as the number one CRM platform as SaaS, we've also acquired some companies and invested in a lot of different uh, elements of businesses, uh, Tableau, MuleSoft, Velocity, more recently the Slack acquisition. And they're all slightly outside of our, our platform in terms of capabilities and what we intend for those to deliver. So our customers have a lot more options in terms of what it means to partner with and invest with Salesforce. Uh, Slack is a great example of where that becomes a communications mesh and infrastructure that allows them to integrate uh, technologies, applications, workflows, et cetera. So you want to rethink almost what is Salesforce and what does it mean in your enterprise? And then coming back to, to the core of what we do, a lot of how we enable our customers is here's an environment. We enable these very quickly. A customer has access to the environment right away. They can set up test environments, sandboxes, start playing with workflows and really reimagine what that environment is going to look like for their internal users and, and their engagement with these applications. So yes, we have run books, we have playbooks, but we've also got enablers in the form of applications. We have a huge application market, if you will, where customers can download different accelerators and try those. We've got a huge network of uh, partners that have delivered rich value added applications. So in most cases, our customer is going to find someone's already created the use case or the application or the workflow they needed. And maybe it's a case of just uh, enhancing that a little bit or updating it a little bit or creating the integration to an in-house system already. So it makes it very exciting, but also makes it a very quick start to solve the problem. Odilson, you guys have a great opportunity with the cloud and cloud scale. Obviously the company's successful, Salesforce is well known, but as data and governance has to be more agile, more secure, often that sounds counterintuitive, but this is the big deal that's happening right now where you need to leverage the scale, you need to have it secure, which you'd think needs to be protective, but making it more permissive is agility. This is the core theme, your, your reaction to wrap up. Uh, all great points. And yes, the, the data isn't useful if it's entirely locked up. So it's how do you bring the user to the data they have access to and that data to provide them value. But especially, and I will put a government lens on this, on the government side, the data is ultimately what our government entities are stewarding. So yes, services, but that data is imperative. So our, our customers understand the value of that data and then also how to not just extract value from it, but how to shepherd and steward the security of that data very well. So for us, it's the ability to get that data to the right users, allow them to construct their business or mission flow on that data, but the data has to persist, has to add value, has to be uh, available for analytics and so on. Adilson Jardim, Vice President of North America Solutions Engineering at Salesforce. Thanks for coming on theCUBE and, and sharing your story and congratulations. A big opportunity ahead for you guys. Congratulations. Absolutely, John, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the week. Okay, CUBE's coverage of AWS reInvent 2021. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.